Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I'm gonna go through all seven habits and share with you my favorite one coming up right now. What's up everyone? Thank you for coming back to the channel. My name is Sean, if you're new here, my channel is all about my journey to financial freedom and I'm documenting all the different things that I'm doing. I'm also doing uh, reviews on self-improvement and personal success books, just like this one. So if that kind of thing interests you, please consider subscribing. So this book was lent to me by a buddy of mine. Um, one thing I really like about this book, if you've gone and listened to my other reviews, I'm not a big fan of books that kind of just tell you how to be some way. I like books that give you instructions, things that you can try, and this book is really good for that. It's got seven good habits of effective people, habits that I actually see really successful folks at work using. I'll share my favorite one, like I said, at the end. But I can't say I do all of these every day, but in books like these, if you can take away one good little nugget, it's worth the read. So definitely check this one out. Without further ado, let's get into the habits. Habit number one is be proactive. Working with really experienced PMs now, I actually see how this is a very, very useful habit. The really good PMs that tend to move things forward and have success are those that are always anticipating the next move. They're always planning ahead. They're always trying to think, okay, what else can I be doing right now? If I'm sitting still, something is wrong. Being proactive is very effective in preventing emergencies in the future. Reactive people might sit there and say, oh, woe is me, my product sucks now, there's too much competition. Whereas proactive people start to think, okay, well, what can I do to make my product better? Why are people going to these competitors? And they start to think about how they can improve. They're, they don't give up, they keep going, they anticipate the next move and they adjust accordingly. The other really good thing mentioned in this chapter is actually not just to worry about everything all the time, that could be what this sounds like, but it's also about differentiating between the things that you can influence and the things you can't. Worry about the stuff that you can actually change. This is just a great piece of advice in life in general. I'm guilty of this, but I tend to stay up sometimes worried about stuff that I can't influence anyway. I have no control over. But if you can differentiate between what you can and can't control and focus on what you can control, you're setting yourself up for success. So that's habit number one. Habit number two is begin with the end in mind. What is a really effective analogy here is imagining your own funeral. It sounds kind of morbid, yes, but think about what you want people to say about you at the end of your life. Do you want people to say, oh, this person was very rich and wealthy? Or do you want them to say, this person was very family oriented and a great friend? Like, let's say you want them to say, this, this person was a very personable, genuine friend. What things are you doing day to day that would get to that result? Are the things that you say you want equal to the things that you're doing? So it's about kind of having like a clear goal in mind, visualizing what that looks like in the future and breaking down the steps to get to that goal. It's very easy once you've got your head down and you're working away to stray away from the path, but having something like a mission statement or a vision statement can always point you in the right direction. It's kind of like your compass, whether you're working on a project or even just giving yourself a way through life. The last really good point here is the book talks about principles. Principles never change. They are rules for your own life that you guide yourself on. And if you are in a job maybe where it doesn't align with your principles, it takes a lot of extra effort to get that job done. Contrast that to a job or a task that really aligns with what you believe in and your principles, you find that you have that energy to get through it. So it's very important that you guide yourself on principles because principles never change. Goals may change, circumstances may change, but your principles don't. Number three, number three. Habit number three, it's about what you say matching what you do. If you say that your relationships are the most important thing in your life, then what do you spend your time on? Are you spending your time watching Netflix and playing video games? Well, maybe that doesn't really match up with what your end goal is, so that's very important. Usually when people read this chapter, I think there's always a little bit of an adjustment to be made. You realize you're not quite on the course you set out to be on. The other thing in this chapter is the priority matrix, which is a two by two matrix that organizes your tasks by urgency and importance. How it works is you have four quadrants. Quadrant one are emergencies, fires that you have to put out, things you have to deal with right away. Quadrant number two ends up being proactive measures, developing relationships, things that need maintenance. Now, quadrant three and four end up being kind of like medial tasks, emails, things that you don't really need and aren't super important, but we sometimes end up getting stuck doing and wasting our time. 
Essentially what the chapter is saying is that if you spend a lot of time in quadrant two, doing maintenance, developing re relationships, doing things that you normally wouldn't consider an emergency, you can prevent fires and emergencies from happening. It's a really good chapter, definitely take a look. What the book ends up saying is like, you kind of divide all your tasks by this quadrant, and then you can set up what you have to do for the week using the matrix to set your priorities. Woo. Okay, habit number cuatro, thinking win-win. So this is when you go into a disagreement or into a negotiation to think win-win. Approach every conversation, trying to find a situation that will benefit both sides. If you have too many lose-win, let's say if like I lose and you win, or win-lose type interactions, eventually the relationship won't last. Thinking win-win will help both people benefit. So an example being used here is two authors writing books. They both have their own audiences that are and fans that are dedicated to their books. Then one author goes to the other, reads their book, likes it, and shares it with his audience. Now that second author has all these new people reading their book. That author goes, whoa, that's kind of weird. Let me read this other author's book. He does the same, likes it, and shares it with his crowd. Now they've both benefited. They've both grown their fan base without having lost anything. The book talks about the subject of scarcity, where we all naturally think that if someone gets something, there's somehow less for me, which is not true. There are a lot of very good win-win situations where everybody can benefit. It's a really good principle to know as well. Time out. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this review so far, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. I'm gonna share my favorite habit of the seven at the end of the video, so stay tuned. Habit number five, seek first to understand and then to be understood. What this basically means is just listen to other people. If you go in guns a blazing into a conversation, the chances of that person hearing you are zero. But if you spend the time to earnestly listen to someone and understand their perspective, at the very least, they will give you the time to listen to your side as well. I've had a few really difficult conversations in my career so far, but I found that if you both approach the conversation earnestly wanting to come to a resolution and remind each other that you have a common goal, you can always seem to find something, some sort of path in the end that both sides can be happy with. Habit number six is synergize. So how many times have you received a problem and then put it on your own shoulders saying, okay, I've gotta be the one to find the solution. I've gotta figure this out. Synergizing kind of means going to your team, going to experts, going to other people, and leaning on them to solve a problem. The point of this chapter is basically saying what one person can do is never as good as what many people or a team can do. Offering different perspectives, finding commonalities, and finding ways to solve the problem is always better than one person trying to do it on their own. Lastly, but not leastly, is habit number seven, which is sharpen the saw. And there's a really good analogy here of a guy trying to cut a tree down, but he's taking forever because his saw is kind of worn out. Second guy comes along, says, hey, why don't you take an hour to sharpen that saw? And the guy's like, I don't have time. I've got to cut this tree down. And he continues to saw and saw and saw. Meanwhile, had he taken an hour to sharpen the saw, he could have cut the tree down more efficiently anyway and been done. What it kind of says is never be too busy because we're all busy in our lives, but never be too busy to take the time to kind of do some maintenance. Take a break, go to the gym, take your mind off work, and do little things like read a book, books such as this that can help refine and really develop those skills that help you do your job better. Taking that time in the end will make you more efficient, make you more productive, and will go further than if you just plug away doing what you always do and kind of not maintaining the saw, not sharpening the saw. So those are the seven habits. Thanks for hanging in there. So to share my favorite one, I'll tell you right now, it's the one that I use most often and it's habit number three. That two by two matrix is really cool. It's really cool for prioritizing your tasks. It's amazing how when you spend your time on things that you don't normally think of, like making phone calls, maintaining relationships, how just talking to people ends up giving you ideas on how to be proactive and preventing those emergency situations where all you can do is react. One example was just making regular phone calls on a project I was working on to the customer. Just keeping them in the loop, I always had these conversations and one of the phone calls, they actually shared with me a lesson that they had from another project. It reminded me to go, hey, maybe I should go check and make sure I've implemented this lesson on mine. Guess what? 
I hadn't. Because of this conversation, I had enough time to go back and fix it, preventing what could have possibly been a reactive issue in the future. So we were able to get off on the right foot to a good start, all because I was having regular conversations without even the intent of pulling any sort of information, just maintaining relationships. So there you have it guys. I hope you liked this video. Please hit the notification bell because on the next video, I'm gonna finish my five and five series. I'm gonna share five tips that you need to know before buying a house or condo. So make sure you stay tuned for that one. Until next time, thanks for watching, share the wealth, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.